Welcome everyone. We are to continue with our topic which was uh, reception, response and coordination in animals. This would be the continuation of the subtopic that we started off on which is uh, parts and functions of the human brain. So subtopic Parts and function of the human brain. As you mentioned before, human brain is a very complex organ that is located on the anterior, that's upper parts of the human body. The brain is covered with three different types of membranes which are known as meninges. The three types of meninges as we had mentioned before are dura mater, located on the outermost parts, pia mater, the innermost parts, then in between dura mater and pia mater, there is a space known as cerebros, I mean, which is known as arachnoid. So the three meninges, dura mater, pia mater, and the space between them, arachnoid. So these are the three membranes known as meninges, that cover the brain. Then, now in this lesson, you're supposed to start on the parts of the brain and look at the functions of the various parts of the brain. The brain is divided into three main parts. But we know that the human brain can be divided into several other parts. But for the purposes of the syllabus, we'll only look at three main parts of the brain and functions of some major parts of the human brain. So in general, the brain is divided into three main parts, namely, forebrain, the midbrain, and C, hindbrain. So these are the three major divisions of the human brain. Forebrain is found on the front part of the brain. This is the cranium or skull. The cranium or skull covers and therefore protects the brain from physical or mechanical injury. Then inside the cranium, we have the brain, which is a very soft organ that can be easily damaged physically or mechanically. The brain itself is divided into front part, forebrain, then the middle part, midbrain, then the back part, hindbrain. So those are the three parts of the human brain, front part, mid part, back part. So the front part is the forebrain, the middle part, midbrain, the back part, hindbrain. Each and every part of the brain has got several other parts. So the, major three, the three major parts are divided into other smaller parts that perform specific functions. Here, I would start off with forebrain. So the forebrain, which is the front part of the brain, is made up of the following major parts. We have A, Cerebrum, B, we have thalamus, C, we have hypothalamus, and 
and the fourth and last part of the forebrain is pituitary gland. So, these are the four subdivisions or four parts of the forebrain. As per the diagram that displays all these parts, I'll show side by side later on. So, cerebrum is the most well-developed and large part of the forebrain. It's very complex and more developed than these other parts. So if you look at cerebrum, which is the most complex and most advanced part of the forebrain, serves specific functions or roles. One, it is the one responsible for integration of most of sensory, uh, I mean, sensory messages. Some of the sensory impulses that are integrated by cerebrum are sight, smell, taste, hearing, ETC. So, cerebrum is the one that is responsible for integration of light in terms of sight, to be capable of, the, of integrating smell, a bad smell or good smell. It is responsible for integration of taste, sweet taste, bitter taste, ETC. It's also responsible for integration of sound, which brings about hearing. So that's one of the functions of cerebrum. Cerebrum is also responsible for memory. That is, it is cerebrum that will be able to make an individual to be able to remember something that he had seen before or something that an individual had learned about before. So ability to remember anything that one had come across or learned about, the part of the brain responsible for memory is cerebrum. Cerebrum is also responsible for an individual's character. The character of an individual is mainly developed within cerebrum. So your character or character of any given individual is determined by cerebrum. The behavior, the way an individual grows and develops, the character of that particular individual is developed within cerebrum. The other function of cerebrum is it is responsible for voluntary activities. So, cerebrum is responsible for voluntary activities like speech. It is cerebrum part of the brain that will bring about movement of the upper and lower lips. So when the upper and lower lips move, they bring about speech. So the way I'm speaking, I can decide to talk about a particular thing or give a story or the way I'm explaining functions of parts of the brain, I'm the one deciding on what to speak about or what to talk about. So it means it's cerebrum part of my brain that is responsible for the actions that I take. For example, writing, I'm the one to decide when to write and what to write. So it means it's cerebrum part of the brain that's responsible for those particular voluntary activities, that is voluntary movement of the muscles of the arm, muscles of the neck, muscles, of the legs that will bring about uh, walking, jumping, running, movement of the lips. So those are voluntary activities. Then, 
Cerebrum also helps in integration of general impulses from the sensory neurons. That is, any message that is brought about by sensory neuron will be integrated by cerebrum, but not all of them, but quite a number of them. The other main function of cerebrum is it is responsible for learning. Ability of an individual to learn and master concepts is made possible by cerebrum. So cerebrum is the part of the brain that will enable an individual to be able to grasp and master concepts. So learning is made possible by cerebrum, e.g. learning how to ride a bicycle, learning how to drive a car, all those aspects of learning are made possible by cerebrum. So in summary, cerebrum is the most well-developed part of the forebrain. Being well-developed and most developed part of the forebrain, it plays some specific functions or roles. The four main functions of cerebrum are integration of sight, when light falls within the eyes, light that has been reflected by an object will be integrated and made to be observed the way it is in terms of color, in terms of depth, in terms of uh, size. All that interpretation is made possible by cerebrum. Ability of an individual to get the smell of, an, uh, of any given chemical substance, whether sweet smell, bad smell, etc., that interpretation of the smell is made by cerebrum. Taste, for the tongue to be able to get the taste of any given chemical substance or food, sweet taste, bitter taste, etc. Any given type of taste is integrated by cerebrum. Hearing, the ability to get sound, interpret the sound into meaningful words or speeches or statements that is made possible by cerebrum. Cerebrum is also responsible for memory enabling an individual to be able to remember whatever he or she had learned. An individual's character, who you are, who your neighbor is, who your parents are, who your teacher is, or any other leader, individual's character is developed by cerebrum. Cerebrum is responsible for voluntary activities, that is what we decide to do. For example, decide to write, that's voluntary activity can decide to shut my eyelids, voluntary activity, speech, voluntary activity, all those are made possible by cerebrum. Cerebrum is the one that brings about those voluntary activities. Learning, cerebrum is the one that's responsible for learning. Then we look at the second part of the forebrain. The second part of the forebrain is thalamus. Thalamus is not as highly developed as cerebrum. Thalamus is usually found slightly above the hypothalamus within the structure of the human brain. For the diagram, both the position of all these other parts of the brain later on in the diagram. Thalamus is a section of the brain that is responsible for integration or interpretation of one, Pain to pleasure. For when an individual feels or suffers from great pain, maybe by stepping on a hard object or sharp object, then, it ends, then the sharp or hot object ends up causing some pain on the foot, that pain is integrated, or inter that nerve impulse is interpreted by the thalamus. So thalamus is the one that is responsible for making an individual feel pain. When you take 
For example, ice cream, those who like ice cream, you feel or derive a lot of pleasure from ice cream. There are some other people whom they touch the novel, they also feel nice and derive a lot of pleasure from it. So, wherever you derive your pleasure from, pleasure is integrated by thalamus. So thalamus, part of the forebrain that is responsible for integration of pain and pleasure. Third part of the forebrain, hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is part of the brain that is located below thalamus. Hypothalamus is responsible for the following, that is functions of hypothalamus. One, homeostatic functions. Hypothalamus has two main homeostatic functions. Homeostasis, by definition, is a self-adjusting mechanism in which body processes are maintained at an almost constant steady state. So, self-adjusting mechanism within the body of an individual that brings about maintenance of body processes at an almost constant steady state. We call that homeostasis. Hypothalamus is part of the brain that's responsible for some, some homeostatic functions of the body. One of the homeostatic functions of hypothalamus is thermoregulation. Hypothalamus has thermoreceptor cells within it. When blood reaches the brain, thermoreceptor cells of the hypothalamus will detect whether body temperature is risen above the norm or body temperature has dropped below the norm. Those changes in body temperature will be detected by thermoreceptor cells of the hypothalamus. Once those changes have been detected, then Hypothalamus will send nerve impulse to various body organs that will adjust appropriately to make the body temperature to be restored back to norm. So, hypothalamus brings about regulation of body temperature, and that is known as thermoregulation. B, osmoregulation. Hypothalamus brings about regulation of amount of water and mineral ions within the blood or within the body. Regulation of water and mineral ions within the body is what we, know, is what we call osmoregulation. Within hypothalamus, there are osmoreceptor cells. Osmoreceptor cells found within hypothalamus are the ones that will detect or determine whether the amount of water within the blood is below the norm or above the norm. The same hypothalamus will determine whether mineral ions within the body are below the norm or above the norm. After detecting whether water and mineral ions within the body are below the norm or above the norm, then hypothalamus will send nerve impulse to the kidneys because within the kidney we have the nephron. Nephron has various parts. We have the loop of handle, we have distal convoluted tubule, and those two parts are the ones that will bring about selective reabsorption of water and mineral ions according to the body's requirement. Or they can make water and mineral source not to be selectively absorbed back into blood if the body has enough of them. So by regulating or controlling amount of water and mineral salts, we say hypothalamus 
place homeostatic function, which in this case is osmoregulation. The other functions of hypothalamus are control sleep and appetite. So hypothalamus will bring about sleep or wakefulness. It is the one that will make an individual feel sleepy. It's the one that will make an individual stay awake. Apart from that, the appetite of an individual is controlled by hypothalamus. So if an individual has lost appetite, then it means it's hypothalamus that brings about that. If an individual has sharp appetite, then it is hypothalamus that also brings about that. So we have three main functions of hypothalamus. One, homeostatic functions. One, thermoregulation, regulation of body temperature. Two, osmoregulation, regulation of water and mineral ions within the blood. The other one, controlling of sleep and wakefulness. Then the last one, appetite. Then we come to the fourth part of the forebrain. Pituitary gland, which is the fourth and last part of the forebrain, this is the master endocrine gland. As he had mentioned earlier on at the beginning of the topic, we talked about two types of communication systems within the body. The two are nervous system and endocrine system. Endocrine system is also known as hormonal system. So you have hormonal system of communication within the body. That means hormones are the chemical transmitter substances. What that means is, it is the hormones that will be responsible for transmission of message from one part of the body to another part of the body where physiological changes take place. So, the part of the brain known as pituitary gland is the one that will control secretion of hormones from other endocrine glands. What it means is, it is pituitary gland that will control or that will influence secretion of hormones by other ductless glands within the body. For example, we do have adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are glands that are located above the kidneys. We also have thyroid gland. Thyroid gland located in the neck region. Thyroid gland secretes a hormone known as, I mean, thyroid gland secretes a hormone known as thyroxine hormone. For thyroxine hormone to be secreted, it is pituitary gland that will bring about secretion of thyroxine hormone by stimulating thyroid gland. So you'll have pituitary gland secreting thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone will then stimulate thyroid gland, which will respond by secreting thyroxine hormone. So in this case, we call thyroid gland master endocrine gland, meaning it's the one that will stimulate all other endocrine glands to secrete particular hormones. If pituitary gland fails to stimulate the other endocrine glands, then no hormones will be secreted. Local example here have given thyroid gland, which is responsible for secretion of thyroxine hormone. Thyroxine hormone has specific functions that we look into later on at the end, towards the end of this topic. So, when pituitary gland secretes thyroid stimulating hormone, this hormone will stimulate thyroid gland, 
When thyroid gland is stimulated by thyroid uh, stimulating hormone from pituitary gland, thyroid gland responds by secreting thyroxine hormone. Thyroxine hormone, you know, is a hormone that will bring about increased rate of metabolism within the body. That means the rate of respiration will increase, a lot of energy will be produced, then that energy will be used to perform specific functions based on the body's needs. So in this case, pituitary gland, as you've mentioned, is the one that secretes hormones that stimulate all other glands that secrete hormones. Therefore, it's known as master endocrine gland. And with that, we are done with the four parts of the forebrain. Then we come to the midbrain. Midbrain is the middle part of the brain. Midbrain is the middle part of the brain whose main function is to transmit nerve impulses between forebrain and hindbrain. So midbrain links forebrain and hindbrain. So midbrain is found in the middle between forebrain and hindbrain. Being found in the middle, it's the one that links the two by transmitting or allowing nerve impulses to move from forebrain to back part of the brain, that is hindbrain. It also channels nerve impulses from the back part of the brain, hindbrain, to the forebrain. So it serves as a link between the two parts of the brain. It also transmits nerve impulses between spinal cord and the brain. Because you mentioned that spinal cord is the posterior extension of the hind brain. So midbrain will also channel nerve impulses from spinal cord to the brain itself. So we have midbrain serving as a link between forebrain and hindbrain. Then the other part of the brain that we look into will be hindbrain, the back part of the brain. So hindbrain is the back part of the brain. The hindbrain comprises of two major parts, namely cerebellum and medulla oblongata. So the hindbrain is made up of two main parts. We have cerebellum and medulla oblongata. So let's start off with cerebellum. Cerebellum is a section of the hindbrain whose functions are Maintenance of body posture. And balance. So, cerebellum is a uh, is part of the hindbrain that is responsible for maintaining body posture and balance. That means, for example, one is traveling in a vehicle and then the body then the body of the vehicle tilts in one particular direction and the individual's body will also react by trying to restore the body to back to its original position. When you're, when you're 
in maybe a tire, the way kids like rolling on tires, it reaches a point where the body, head faces downwards, the legs face upwards. That means the body will also have to adjust in a particular way that will make it feel comfortable. So to bring about maintenance of body posture and balance, it is cerebellum that plays that part in association with the ear. But you'll come to the ear later on because you know that the ear also helps in maintaining body posture and balance. So cerebellum along with the ears serve to bring about maintenance of body posture and balance. Then medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata is a section of the hindbrain that is responsible for involuntary activities. Some of the involuntary activities that are maintained by medulla oblongata are swallowing, inhalation and exhalation vomiting vasodilation and vasoconstriction ETC. So, involuntary activities in this case refers to some changes that take place within the body without an individual deciding on whether they should happen and how they should happen. For example, an individual could be eating and at the same time telling stories. But as the individual chooses food, he or she will find him or herself swallowing food without deciding whether it's time for him or her to swallow food. So swallowing even of saliva is an involuntary activity that is controlled by medulla oblongata. Inhalation and exhalation, that is inhalation breathing in, exhalation breathing out. Breathing in and out happens whether an individual is conscious or subconscious. When a dead asleep, inhalation and exhalation takes place, meaning it's not an individual who decides whether to breathe in or to breathe out. It happens automatically. But during physical exercises, one can decide on the duration of inhalation or exhalation. Vomiting. It's not an individual who decides when to vomit or not. It happens automatically. So that's an involuntary activity that is controlled by medulla oblongata. Vasodilation, vasoconstriction. In hot weather, the peripheral blood vessels found within the skin expand and come close to the surface of the skin. That helps in losing excessive heat from the body to surrounding environment, which brings about cooling of the body in hot weather. Vasoconstriction, peripheral blood vessels of the skin contract and move deep into the skin. This helps in minimizing heat loss to external environment during cold weather. Vasodilation and vasoconstriction are controlled by medulla oblongata. By controlling vasodilation and vasoconstriction, it will also help to influence blood pressure. Dilation of the pupil of the eye to allow more light in when there is dim light and constriction of the pupil to minimize the amount of light entering into the eyeballs when an individual is exposed to bright light. That is controlled by medulla oblongata. So medulla oblongata is responsible for controlling involuntary activities, as you mentioned, the four or five. So in short, the brain 
has three main parts, the forebrain, midbrain, back part or hind brain. Each and every part of the brain is divided into sections that perform specific functions that we had seen before. And that marks the end of our lesson for now. In the next lesson, we look at the cranial nerves, spinal nerves, then start on spinal cord. Thank you for now.